welcome everyone. Uh, this seminar is about perennial food crops. And um, uh, we are um, the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. That's me, Joanne. Ta -da. And um, we are an affiliated chapter with the Master Gardeners Association of BC. And we're partnering on this project with the Nanaimo, um, here we go, the Nanaimo branch of the um, Vancouver Island Regional Library. Um, the uh, perennial ornamentals, uh, or perennial vegetables and ornamentals um, is um, a subject that's really near and dear to me. Um, and there are so many reasons to be growing this uh, type of plant. But before we begin, um, let's do a bit of housework. Uh, the seminar is copyrighted, uh, owned by um, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and the Vancouver Island Regional Library. So the contents are the property of these two uh, folks, and it's intended for educational purposes only. That means that commercial use for all or part of it is prohibited without express written consent. Um, now, the information in this, uh, in this seminar is science-based. And uh, that's part of the Master Gardener's mandate is that we give information that is current and science-based and it is accurate to the best of our knowledge. So therefore, the use um, of the information is at your own discretion. Um, you'll see that the uh, images in this uh, seminar, they're all examples of perennial vegetables and um, many of them are actually from um, the gardens I've had in the past. A uh, quick thing on the Master Gardeners Association, it's part of an international organization of specially trained volunteer teachers. It takes you two years to become a, a Master Gardener. Um, we work in partnership with public sector agencies. The library is a great example, as well as private enterprise will perhaps go to a garden center and um, answer questions from the public. Um, and we promote science-based, sustainable horticultural, uh, horticultural knowledge and methods. Um, all, uh, all the images, as I said, are edible perennials. And some of these images are from internet sources. Every image is attributed to the source on the face of the image. Uh, and that's just out of respectful copyright um, acknowledgement and, um, and law, that's what you're supposed to do. And we do thank the individuals and companies for their use. So let's begin. This image is actually a, a globe artichoke and it's Violetta. And it was one of my very, very favorites. Um, and uh, here we go. Now we have many um, ancient food crops. And my job here is to introduce you to growing vegetables. These crops that you see in this image, again, from uh, a garden of mine, are ones that we know. And um, they are the fruits, the berries, the seeds and grains, and the nuts from shrubs, subshrubs, and trees. But the, um, the vegetables are something that we don't know as much about, at least in North America. I'm going to try to explain to you some of the rewards of these plants, as well as the challenges. I'm going to try to help you understand how to identify the ones you actually have. And if anyone um, took the time with the handout, you'll see what the fun quiz, quizzes were partly about. I want to help you find new ones understand how they can fit into your overall landscape and your, and your plans, uh, your, your style, your design, because there really is a perennial food crop for just about any type of garden. I wanna give you some ideas on how to landscape with um, these edible plants. And it's a huge subject. There's um, all sorts of grand schemes, there's all encompassing philosophies, and I'll go over these in brief, but only so you don't get bogged down in them. 
the one thing that I can tell you is that a lot of them are actually quite old and we're not inventing new things so much as rediscovering them. Now, at one point in the seminar, I will go over a few botany basics. Um, there are a lot of people here who are very knowledgeable gardeners, but there are some beginners as well. And I want to cover these grounds uh, and we'll do it quickly uh, just so I feel comfortable as well as you feel comfortable with knowing how to identify a plant and what to ask for when you're looking for a perennial edible. And that's often because they're very similar to an annual plant uh, and you may ask for the wrong thing and who needs to fail at gardening. Now, I'm going to also point you to some good books and some good websites. And so we'll just take things step by step. So the one thing is to remember, as I said, is that we're rediscovering um, rather than inventing the edible perennial vegetables. And it's because our ancestors had to work very hard to grow their food. So when they found a plant that could do more than one job and they didn't have to replant every year, they cultivated it. Now, uh, flax, for instance, um, a multi-use plant has actually, they think, been in production for 30,000 years. Can you? I mean, that's Neolithic. That's remarkable. Um, they made uh, sailcloth out of it. Um, they made yarn. They used it for oil. Uh, it was food for humans and farm animals. And then nettles, which grows both in Europe and uh, in North America. Again, nettle yarn was very important. And here on the coast, um, the Tla'aman uh, people from Powell River area, they traded with the island folk um, from Sna'alma and um, the Kawitsan people uh, because these folks on the island were great weavers and the nettle yarn was a very important um, um, stable and strong um, yardage for blankets. Uh, so uh, you also got cooked greens, you've got medicine. Uh, cardoon was a really big uh, Mediterranean plant. They think first grown um, in very early biblical times um, by uh, the Jewish people. Um, and a part of the reason was was that it is a vegetable source of rennet. So fitted into the kosher uh, food culture of those peoples. Um, it was also cooked greens. And um, all of these plants are also important pollinator plants. So you can see how when they found an edible perennial, they really nurtured it. Now, here's our quiz. Uh, there are about 200, about 200 different foods we harvest from perennial plants. And uh, except for asparagus, artichoke, choke, uh, rhubarb, um, Canadians don't know a lot of them. Uh, they, um, they're not a fruit or a seed or a nut, which are all technically uh, a type of fruit. Um, and the advantage of vegetables is that you're not just eating the seed um, or the fruit or the nut, which as I said, are seeds. You're able to harvest the plant, um, different parts of the plant. So let's look at the ones that a lot of us actually grow it as annuals. And um, we'll use the pen here. So here we have the, um, the herbs. Um, we have rosemary here. Um, this is mint. Down here, this lovely little purple sage, which was a favorite one in my garden. Um, on the right-hand corner, we have oregano, and there we have thyme. Uh, wonderful edibles, wonderful landscapes, and we will deal specifically with herbs in a moment. Of course, here we have uh, asparagus. This is a favorite of mine. I love nasturtiums and we eat the flowers, uh, we can eat the leaves, wonderful salad, and the stems also are edible. This is a raw food. 
Number four, this is a runner bean. Runner beans, unlike regular beans, either bush beans or vine beans, are perennials. And you can tell the difference between a runner bean and a regular bean because of the way they turn on the stalk. You can see that this one turns this way, whereas the beans turn uh, the other way. And here are, here's the scarlet runner flower. It's a lovely um, plant to grow up uh, a, a pergola or on an ugly fence. And here's the bean itself. Of course, everyone recognizes number five, the potato. And uh, this though, I wonder if you recognize. That's a French shallot and you can really tell it from other alliums because of that kind of curve. Now you don't see the curve so much uh, when you're looking at the greens above ground, but as you pick it up, as you, as you uh, harvest it, you'll see that curve. Every allium has a hollow stem. That's how you can tell that group. These little guys in here uh, are Egyptian walking onions, the top set onion. Number seven is, is a, a perennial kale. Our, the kale that we are used to growing is, is the biennial kale, but there is a perennial kale. We'll talk about that specifically later. This was one of my favorites of uh, my winter garden, which is a sugarloaf chicory. It kind of looks like a big old lettuce, doesn't it? And uh, it's related to the radicchio. There's a whole group of chicories that are um, grown in the winter garden, but are also perennial. And this is the my favorite, the sugarloaf chicory, which um, you could roast or saute. And this one, most of you probably got off the top of your head, uh, and those are yams. Again, uh, very easy to grow. They always made me a little bit nervous because um, they're in the uh, morning glory family. And of course, anyone that's had to deal with bindweed, just the look of the uh, heart-shaped uh, leaves, it makes me nervous. You'll notice this is from copyrighted from the spruce.com. And they are a very reliable source of good garden information. So here are the answers to the quizzes which will also be on your handout. And um, that, oh, let's go back a moment. This little guy here uh, is Salad Burnett. And I really loved that uh, in my perennial garden because I kept it in the herb garden because it tastes like cucumber. It's quite lovely. And let's look at reasons to, to uh, grow perennials. First of all, as I've mentioned, you can get multiple harvest from one plant in the same season because they, uh, you can harvest them at different growth stages. Now, not every plant is harvested at every stage, but by using a combination of perennial vegetables, you have uh, different types of food at different stages all through your season. This is an important thing um, when we're concerned with climate change. Perennials are the backbones of our gardens. And if you look around, you have your trees, you have your understory uh, trees, you have your shrubs and your sub shrubs, which are lower, and then you have your ground plants. And the more types of plants that you can grow in your yard, uh, uh, that will tolerate different conditions, the more stable uh, the landscape. And when you begin to add my yard and my neighbor's yard and my neighbor's neighbors, you get a whole string of uh, rows, but also blocks of land within the urban environment, as well as suburban and the exurban environments that create a stability within your climate zone. And studies since the 1960s have shown that. So yes, gardening is good for the climate. And they're also less seasonal labor. 
Uh, just think about, well, if you say have an apple tree, you go, oh God, it's so much work. I got to go on, I got to prune, I got to do this. I gotta, and yet you only do one thing for the season and it produces a lot of food. And if I'm growing a perennial kale, it's a lot less work than if I have to replant, redo the ground, do everything every year. They're equally beautiful, beautiful as non-edible shrubs are. And we'll show you some pictures of those. And because of their stability and their long life, you need fewer soil amendments than annuals. I will amend saying um, long life. Some are short-lived perennials, but then a lot of the perennials in our garden are short-lived anyway. The neat thing that I really enjoyed was the discovery of new flavors. And um, I, over the years, have had several people saying, wow, that's a really interesting flavor. I've never tasted that before. And they've gotten quite turned on to a new flavor, a new idea, even though uh, they had never thought of, of being adventuresome. This is the other thing too, is that these are ancient plants, most of them, uh, species. Um, and because the perennials and most of them are flowering plants, they attract birds and they attract beneficials. And when you can have birds and beneficial insects like bees and different types of wasps and ground beetles, you reduce garden pests, they do the work for you. And this is the nice thing as well. Most are less susceptible to disease than annual edibles. And that's partly because they've not been as hybridized in recent years as many of our annual crops. And they're very stable uh, plants because most of the species are old and our ancestors only grew things that didn't give them a lot of trouble. This is fun too. Many have higher nutritional net levels than annual and biannual counterparts. I can't really give you a big list, except that the studies that I've done or read rather um, have shown this. So let's move on to more reasons to grow. And this is one of my favorite reasons. And it's because they thrive in problem soils and problem light conditions. And we all have those in our landscapes. And when we get to planning, uh, we can talk about that. Um, and that's uh, a pansy, which of course is edible. So you can put them under trees, certain of them. So you don't have to have more space. They can't put them under all trees. You can put them under particular trees and in particular ways. And so you'll find out as you go along and learn. A very good example would be um, fiddlehead ferns. If you have a big old uh, Douglas fir in the corner of your yard, uh, you can grow ferns around the, the edges of it. You can also use them as ground cover in rocky areas. There are a lot of spreading, spreading plants. Um, draping a thyme uh, over a rockery uh, and having it beautiful pink blooms, um, a wonderful example. Boggy ground is another uh, problem area that um, several edible perennials are very happy in. And they're quite, they're quite pretty there too. Again, uh, hot, rocky areas. And that was one of my favorites because I, at the back of a yard that I had, it was very rocky, very open, very dry. And um, it also, uh, there was an ugly fence uh, between my neighbor and my, my neighbor's backyard and our backyard. And I planted all my cardoon and my artichokes. Uh, they grew to be five feet tall. My lovage was six feet tall. I had this wonderful, wonderful back screen that was all edible. Then I threw in some sunchokes and in front some scorzonera and I had flowers as well. Of course, 
I had digger bees move in. Uh, so I had two artichoke plants. We'll see pictures of them later that flowered uh, because the bees got that area. And that was just fine with me. Um, okay, we have bumped out a share screen. Let's go back. There we go. And we're down to here. We have to go into slideshow. I have no idea why we bumped out, but let's uh, uh, let's just keep going here and we will go down. Um, it's not wanting to do that. Is everyone seeing this screen? Doesn't look like it. Um, okay, we have a bit of a problem. You can see it. It's just, yeah, it's not in the slideshow. It's not in the slideshow. Oh, okay. Well, I'll try it again. Let's try this. There we go. Yeah, Ta -da. Who knows why that did that? But, and so the other place that you can grow them is partial or complete shade. Uh, which is often a problem in our gardens. And if you can grow something lovely and edible in that grade, we have um, not only boggy ground, but pond plants. Two examples would be lotus. Uh, we eat the uh, tubers of lotus um, or duckweed. It's a, it's kind of tastes like chickweed, except that it floats. And if you have a small um, uh, pond, uh, which can be above ground. Uh, one of my friends uh, took their grandkids' uh, swimming pool, turned it into a, a pond, which I thought was a lot of fun. My little water feature, um, I have in a giant barrel and there's duckweed and my circulator uh, is actually not a circulator pump, but a solar powered uh, floating um, fountain and that gives, gives enough flow. Um, and of course, as I said before, they are uh, pollinator friendly. Um, what else? Um, now, uh, I believe you have this list as well, and it's examples of the parts of food. Uh, that you can get from vegetables. Here you can see at the upper left, that image of the lotus. At the lower left, those are actually hosta sprouts that you can, you can grow. And you can see when they get crowded, you can take some of those sprouts out and still get lovely, lovely leaves. And at the lower right is the edible broccoli. Uh, or the perennial broccoli. And you can see how much it shows its relationship to cauliflower. You'll notice that um, some of the uh, uh, plants appear in more than one column. And that's just to give you an idea of how a plant will have more than one harvest at different times. Um, now, uh, so you will have the other list, which is the big alphabetical list, which is much more general, and that's in your handouts. I wanted you to have those two so you can begin to match flavors you're interested, places to grow, and we'll get into this more as we go along. Now, a very neglected part of ed edible perennials are the herbs. Um, I see so many gardens where herbs are relegated to very pretty, but very little tiny specimens in a formal knot garden, or they're just used along a border. Uh, the uh, idea of using um, culinary herbs along a border uh, is very useful. I used to grow my chives right along my sidewalk and my garlic chives as well, because they're actually hardier and so they would stay green longer. And I didn't have to get my feet muddy when I went out. Um, many herbs come from the Mediterranean. So they like um, lean soil and lots of sun. And that's where you can make use of them in the landscape. You'll see the lavender, which we all know likes the hot. Um, here is garlic scapes. 
Um, it is um, uh, the second harvest. Uh, well, it's the first harvest because they come out in June and you cut them and you saute them. They're a great favorite in European cuisine. Some people um, have said, well, if you cut the scapes, um, the garlic won't hold for more than a year. Fine. I've never had my garlic even last a year. So I don't really worry about that. Um, and when you cut the scape, the plant concentrates on its bulb. It's the nature of a bulbous plant. Um, when the top gets eaten, it puts more into cloning, which is the bulb. Chicory, of course, um, and dandelion. I loved bronze fennel, this guy here, um, as um, kind of an anise gar um, dill type flavor, uh, the little fronds, these little guys here um, in salads. And I always let it go to seed and I chewed the fennel, a great stomach um, help. Chicory, of course, is um, a good coffee substitute. And um, they're well known in perfumes and, pot and potpourris. Um, uh, wines and liqueurs. I recently read that chartreuse has 21 different herbs in it. They make nourishing teas, which we are all aware of. Um, salad greens. Now here's our little dandelion, which makes uh, the little young leaves make wonderful uh, salad greens. And the dandelion, when it blooms, is um, the single richest source of pollen for wild bees. So even though it's a weed, I always let mine grow a little bit um, and uh, catch them before they go to seed, just because they are so important to the bees. They come out just after the crocus and um, the bumblebees mine them like crazy. Um, the other thing that it's used for is pest deterrence. Now, the uh, pest deterrence are um, a quality of herbs, partly because they attract beneficials. The other reason is because their smell is actually very strong and they confuse a lot of pests. So we have, um, uh, lemon balm for liqueurs, lavender, mint, chamomile for teas, fennel, mint, lemon balm, burnet, lovage, sweetest uh, uh, alyssum for salad greens. We have rosemary, chives, catnip, tansy that are our pest deterrents. And of course, we have cooked greens. Again, mint, burnet are two. They make great landscape plants. Later on, um, I'll show you a picture of my oregano in bloom. Um, a lemon balm is a wonderful uh, landscape plant, particularly if you put it um, near an area where you're gonna walk, you rub against it, you get a lovely um, a scent. Lovage is a huge stately specimen plant. Um, caffeine uh, drinks or uh, free drinks like chicory root, dandelion root, both very good um, as a caffeine drink when you dried the root. Uh, and they're, as I said, friends to beneficial insects and they're um, very good for uh, salves, emollients. Uh, anyone that's been into herbs understands those ones. Uh, ca uh, calendula, um, alyssum, all sorts of those things. Now, uh, so we have the vegetables that we recognize, the perennial, most of them subshrubs, but some of them sh uh, big shrubs, and we have herbs. Now, the last group are ornamentals. Um, they can be the exotic ones, like I, I mentioned, this very stately lovage. Um, they can um, be plants that bring to life a hard to plant area. Uh, and um, even in, in difficult kind of boring areas, I used to plant my cacti and my squash um, right along my back driveway. And oh boy, did they love the heat. Um, the opunta would flower and the squash would just suck up the heat and get all plump. 
So um, here we have the second uh, group. And did you get any surprises? <laughs> One of the reason I put this in the handout was to illustrate um, the one caveat about the ornamental uh, perennial vegetable. Um, and that is that some of some parts are very edible, but some parts are toxic. And um, our old friend, the rhubarb is a very good example. We depend on the stems, but the oxalic acid in the big leaves um, really are not good for you. Um, so what do we have? The fern fronds. Now I put this in as kind of a trick question because the image is actually the ornamental lady fern. You can't eat the fronds. Um, we're all used to the um, fiddlehead and that's a different plant. So you gotta know your plants. Now all um, parts or, or all leaves of the camellia species in flowers are edible, but they're quite second rate. And um, we, I attended a um, lecture this morning and um, the um, fellow said, yes, they're all, they're all um, good tea plants. But the real tea plant, which is the image of that, that little plain flower is the Camellia sinensis. And that's the tea plant, makes the best tea. I so enjoyed making tea from that. Um, now the um, Celsify and, and Scorzonera, they, they are related. One is called Black Celsify and the other is called Brown Celsify. The Scorzonera in the image is the Black Celsify that I grew. Um, and that's how they differentiate it, the uh, Scorzonera uh, Hispanica. Now the flowers and the mature leaves are no, you don't eat them, but the tubers, uh, Yes, that's the part you eat. And the very young leaves that the English call chards, um, they're both mild and tasty. And salsify is a source of inland fiber. So if you have problems eat, eating carbohydrates, you can eat that very well uh, without a problem, just as the sunchoke is a source of inland fiber. The only thing that one needs to say about that is some folks um, cannot digest inulin fiber, so it bloats them up a little bit. But live and learn, huh? Now here we have the ostrich fern, the fiddlehead. So you still can't eat the fronds, but you eat the fiddleheads, the young um, greens before they unfold. Now the lookalike, which is bracken fern, I made a note that yeah, it was eaten, but it's actually it's actually considered toxic. The nasturtiums, we've also mentioned, um, you um, can eat a lot of them uh, and they have a very unique flavor. I also used to pickle the um, seed heads. They're called false capers or poor man's capers. Here's one, again, that you're careful of. The uh, Solomon seal young shoots, you can eat. They're a good tasty, um, asparagus alternative, but you don't want to eat any other part. And rose petals, of course, we all know this image is our native uh, Nutka rose. So that kind of gives you um, a sense of how easy it is to add perennial uh, food crops to your garden. Let's look at the next couple of slides, which are a little bit technical. Um, but as you're going to be discovering um, new plants, um, it, you're going to be encountering these designs and philosophies, um, and you can get very bogged down in them because many writers or lecturers feel that if you, if you don't encompass the whole thing, it really won't work. And that's simply not true. Do one thing at a time. Don't get too ambitious. Ambition will kill a gardener faster than anything. Do it one thing at a time. And here's some wonderful um, examples of, um, 
do I have? Yeah, this is my friend's garden right here. Um, and it's right next to her front stairs. She has potted herbs right here. Um, and here's her iris. And you see, look, at this is her lettuce. And these holes in the back here was where she's already harvested some. And this is uh, oregano. And I'm not sure what this one to the left is. Um, so uh, she just put this right in her front garden. And it's just a small space. And it works very well. Um, this one down in the bottom left is a real forest garden. Um, here is a 20 year old fig tree. Um, we have hollyhocks here. Um, the roots are what they uh, would make marshmallows out of. Um, and there's some herbs in the front here. Uh, and back there is the wisteria. Um, up in the upper right, we have from the Gove, uh, Groveg people, um, an image of um, an absolutely gloriously rampant herb garden, uh, complete with the pathway and all the different types of herbs. So you see, there's lots of designs and ideas that you can use. Let's go into some of these. And many of them, um, are new words for old methods. Now, the resurgence of the interest in the perennial food crops, it sort of engendered this wonderful new look at, at how we wanna design our limited spaces and how we wanna deal with some philosophies uh, within the idea of a sustainable ecosystem. And as I said before, many of them are really a rediscovery of old ways. Um, our ancestors recycled because you had to. We recycle. Well, yes, we have to, but we're just rediscovering that we have to. Now, let's look at these things. Here we have a woodland garden, and that is um, a style of garden that talks about layers. Uh, so you have your big tree layer, which is called the canopy. You have your understory. You have your shrub layer. You have your ground layer or your, yeah, your ground layer um, or your flower layer. And that is a very particular type of design. Often in the middle, um, you'll have a lawn. The um, old term of... Um, a mixed garden actually fit into the idea of the woodland garden because it was both a food garden and um, a ornamental garden. The same reply uh, applies to your mixed landscape. It just talks about larger space rather than a tiny backyard. Um, this is a term you'll come across um, forest garden, and it is um, another way of looking at the woodland garden, but in an edible um, context. So whereas the woodland garden will deal with your four layers, the forest garden uh, talks about seven layers because it adds the below ground layer. It talks about a shrub layer, a sub shrub layer, and then the ground cover layer and it also talks about vines so you've got seven layers in the forest garden you'll see this um, in a lot of your british books because it's a more northern approach uh, not a more northern approach it comes from a climate that is more northern although it is very much influenced by the sea the way we are and it has a lot more shade and um that makes it very useful for us when we're looking at different plants. Edible landscaping, of course, is obvious. Um, just as edible ecosystem, that's just the larger term. And it talks more about how people interact within the edible landscape. Um, and it's a third generation of this term permaculture which is really what we're talking about, permaculture. Now, permaculture is 
a very specific philosophy that uses certain terms like guilds and uh, a certain way of doing things. And it's, it's a fun thing to look at. The two men that started the permaculture movement, one of the first things they said was that it's a hybrid. They took a bit of this, a bit of that. It works quite well. And the other two terms here, polyculture is um, a way of describing the permaculture philosophy. And interplanting is the same as polyculture. Um, you might uh, interplant uh, lettuce and carrots and you spread out your carrots um, not in big blocks, but you spread them out because it confuses the carrot rust fly. Um, the carrot rust fly needs to land on a carrot plant three times um, as it bounces from plant to plant. Um, so it knows there's enough food for its babies. And if you spread these plants out, um, just by the nature of flipping the coin, um, it's less likely that that um, uh, animal is going to um, lay its eggs. So when you get to looking at things, you'll run across these ideas. Um, now, uh, the, the next thing we're going to go on to is in technicalities is how long is it gonna grow? And this is a bit of a soapbox of mine because you go into a garden center and now you see it a, a lot in um, catalogs as well. They mislabel what a plant is. Um, oh, off to the side here, we have my oregano. Look at it, it's a huge thing. This thing was about five feet wide and about two and a half feet tall. I could hack it back. It was a wonderful, wonderful landscape plant. So let's look here. Um, we have annuals. Now it doesn't matter what you do to an annual, it will die at the end of the year. It's genetics mean it sprouts, it grows, it flowers, it dies, uh, it, all in one year. Now, a hardy annual will take a bit of frost. A tender annual will not. And those are the plants we buy that we either have to bring inside, like, like my fuchsia, every winter, um, or um, you will find them um, in zone 10, you know, uh, tropical vines and things like that. Now, a self-sowing annual just means that it gives a lot of seed and that can be very useful. Um, my bronze fennel, um, which some people say can be invasive, I would always collect the seed. And so I never found it invasive and it just got to be a beautiful stately plant. Now, the biannual, um, does the same thing as the annual, only it takes two years. It grows the vegetative form the first year, flowers the second year. Biennials are a very important food, food plant in our traditional garden. Um, all your cabbage crops are biennials, for example. Now, in, in a, a good catalog, they will say biennial grown is an annual. So that means that it's um, not really hardy in the zone um, and that you may not get it to, it might not flower uh, because it's meant to flower the next year. Uh, and they'll also say biennial forced to a short-lived perennial. And there are a couple of plants, say like chard, Swiss chard is a very good example where it's actually a biennial but by very carefully cutting out the flowers, the flowering stalk, it kind of goes vegetative. And I've kept my chard for like three years, made it a short uh, lived perennial and um, protected it a bit over winter. And then it begins to get a bit woody and whatnot. And I, I get rid of it. Now the perennial, now this is, um, one that people will say, well, it's an annual, but you can take it in over winter and grow it as perennial, then it's not an annual. It's probably a tender perennial. And um, that's important when you're looking for perennial food plants. 
So you'll see people will say it's a perennial grown as an annual, which can mean that it's uh, tender or not. It's just not a plant people usually grow uh, as um, a perennial. Um, calendula is a good example. It's actually a perennial, but most people just grow it as an annual because it does bloom that first year. Here's a rule of thumb. Most culinary herbs are perennials. That's why they make great landscape plants. Many of them are short-lived perennials and that's okay. You haven't done anything wrong. They're just meant to live a few years and then pass on. Those plants are usually the ones that produce a lot of seed and seed can be very, very valuable. Um, I grow sprouts and microgreens and um, having seeds uh, to grow sprouts and microgreens is important. Here's the other one. Almost of all tubers and all bulbs are perennial. That means all your alliums, all your onion group are perennial. So those are important to know because you'll find um, that um, one species of a plant will be annual and the others won't. A good example is kale. Most kale is biennial. There are two types of perennial kale. One is called uh, Dabenton uh, da or Dauberton that's spelled in two different ways. So we'll go through the last bit of technicality here, which is a plant by any other name <laughs> and it's basic botany. Now I put the information in your handouts as the alliums to illustrate. So you've got binomial nomenclature, which is just like the phone book, surname first, which is the genus, and then the species, which is the individual plant. The genus is capitalized, sometimes abbreviated with the first capital letter. The species is in the lower case. Um, you'll also see that it's put in italics because it's in Latin. So that's how you can tell it's Latin and it's not misspelled. Now, there are a lot of species within a genus, just like you've got brothers and sisters in the same family. You'll notice that if there's an SP after the genus, it relates to everybody in that family. Um, sometimes you'll get what I like to call a person's nickname, and that's the variety of the plant. And when you're with your ornamentals and you want a particular flower color, you'll often look for a variety. Um, it's bred for a certain species. Now, when uh, an important plant that you want has got an X, um, it is a cross that is often very old and has sort of become its own plant and will breed true. Now, here's again the example from the alliums. They're all um, allium sepa uh, here. And that refers to a plant with a head or a bulb. And those are your onions. But your top set onions, look, remember the cross that I mentioned? It's a cross between the common onion, the uh, sepa, and the perennial evergreen onion, which is the fistula, fistulosum. Um, then we have garden chives. So again, uh, uh, the foliusum re refers to the uh, flavor of the leaves. There's your variety or cultivar. Um, and it is another species uh, from your um, normal onion. And you have garlic, you have uh, uh, regular chives, and you also have another species, which are your garlic chives that's used in oriental uh, foods. Now, here we go, look at this. Garlic is Allium sativum. But look down here, right at the very bottom, elephant garlic. It's actually a leek because you can see here your, gar garden, your common garden leek is Allium purum. And the wild leek is Allium, Allium, boy, I am stumbling on my tongue today. Um, Ampelosa, <laughs> there we go, you can read it. But you see there's the cross here, your elephant garlic the variety. So not only the species, but the variety of the same name, Ampel oprosum. So this is why when you're looking for your um, 
perennial vegetables and you're buying seed, always ask for the exact plant. And if you're in a garden uh, um, center and they can't tell you that, then don't get the plant. Next, drawbacks. There's drawbacks to everything, even having to listen to me for an hour and a half. And first of all, and this is a dahlia that I, that I loved very much. And dahlia tubers are also edible. And what's really neat is dahlia flowers, the petals off dahlias are edible and different dahlias have different flavors. Some flavors are foreign to what we're used to. They can be very spicy when we're not used to. The, the Euro, a lot of Asian, say, um, now the daylily is an important plant in um, Asian cuisine. You can eat the flowers. You stuff the buds. They're really neat. I put like rice and cheese in them and then throw them into the pan. Um, you can deep fry them. Uh, you can eat the stems. You can eat the tubers. Um, they have a very unique flavor. Uh, if you've got daylilies in your garden, you can test them. European bitters, um, a lot of people in North America don't get on with them. But if you like radicchio, you will have a taste for the chicories, which are the European bittery, bitters. Um, now, some are, uh, your plants are harvested differently from the annual crops. They may be harvested at different times. For instance, your hosta. You harvest it very early, but not all of them. Um, you, if you're going to be eating a hosta sprouts, you'll probably want more than one plant. Now, some are slow to establish. Uh, that's no different than um, any other perennial. My, my big cardoon took a good two years to really establish and they were happy in that rocky rocky dry ground but until they established I had to make sure they got enough water. Some seeds are hard to find but if you're like me the hunt is so much fun. Now if they're herbaceous for instance your runner beans um, they will die back so you need to put a marker in there because the runner bean uh, fleshy root is not easily identified if you dig down and look at it. Um, but they can be very, very beautiful. I grew three types, one with the red flower, the scarlet runner bean, the um, Sadie's horse bean that I showed you an image of, and the painted lady, which was red and white. And they produced slightly different flavors, different colors of beans. And to my mind, they make the best horticultural bean. Now, some, some of the plants have to be replanted each year. Now, the perfect example is tubers. Um, one of my friends um, leaves several of um, her potatoes uh, in the ground because it's well drained and she just puts mulch over top of it and they do very well and come up the next year. Um, even she, where she will move some of those tubers so they're evenly distributed. Um, uh, the same with the top set onions. You will pull several of them and then you stick a few in the ground. So they take a little bit more um, work. Now, how, let's, for the last part, let's go about the best ways to go about this. And um, you have this on your handout as well. First of all, Learn what perennials you already have, which was the point for our two silly little quizzes, uh, just to give you an idea of, my goodness, look at that. Um, the next thing you do is taste the plant. You can taste it raw. You can cook with it. Um, for instance, lots of people will pick nettles. Um, they think that they're a pest. Um, they make wonderful greens in a stew. And each spring, we make pesto with them. Oh, what a flavor. Um, if you find the plant, you've tasted it, um, is it also something that's going to fit into the type of food you eat? Um, 
I used to eat a lot more Oriental cuisine than I do now. I usually, I've got some wonderful restaurants around and I will buy the food. So I don't eat um, uh, the daylily so much. Um, so I don't grow as much daylily. Um, and now that I've um, moved out of a big garden area, I have one pot of daylilies. Um, now, if you like it, um, you might want to grow more. You might want to leave it where it is. You might want to move it to another place, particularly if it's something you've been growing as an annual. Now, if you don't, you can decide how you want to use it. There are plants that um, I grow as annuals um, that are perennials. A lot of people do, particularly if they're ornamental. You can also get rid of it. That's what plant sales are for. Now begin your hunt. You taste the other perennials. Make a list of the ones you want because you're not going to keep track of them. And you also have to get the right name. Remember our alliance list. And then when you get the right name, and we'll talk about books in a moment, um, understand their growing needs. And here's where you can um, really get ahead of the game. Decide where you're going to put it in your garden. And if you need more than one place, more than one plant, decide that. And then look at your trouble spots. And you'll usually find from the big lists that I've given you that there's actually something that would fit there. So here's our book list. And these are from the library. Um, you've got a handout. Um, and um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so you can see me. There we go. Can everyone see me? Okay. Um, here's a book um, by Martin Crawford. And it is one of the best. It is quite um, a good one because um, now it's English. Uh, pretty much everything that's going to grow there will grow here. And he talks about the plants individually what their needs are to grow and how to use them in the culinary setting. So you get a lot of information. Here's another one, which is um, ornamental plants. These have a lot more shrubs and trees and whatnot, but what is kind of fun about them is um, they will give you lists of edibles that you might not know already. And um, I believe this is the one for Canadian gardens, um, Mike LaSalle. And he talks about stuff right in Vancouver and Vancouver Islands. Yes, the uh, four Canadian gardens. So it's very, very local and a really lovely book for your ornamentals. Now this fellow, Eric Tonsmeyer, uh, very important in the permaculture um, group of people and he approaches his books um, in a far more botanical way. Um, um, here we go, go back to share. And um, so he divides his plants by families and um, it's sometimes then a little harder to get into the plant um, because he just, he'll talk about this group of plants. The valuable thing is that when you talk about groups of plants, once you know the cultivation needs of one, you usually know the cultivations of several others. There was one um, that um, April introduced me to, and it's this one by Angela England, Gardening Like a Ninja. And she very much takes this uh, same attitude, one at a time. Take one, um, sneak a few into the landscape, uh, and that's kind of kind of fun. And um, the resilient herbs um, is is a good um, uh, section of this particular book by Acadia Tucker. All these books have not only good lists, but they have tables. So you can say, okay, I need a plant that's three feet tall for semi-shade in this zone, and they will have a list. 
So these books are really handy to have. Um, this particular image here is um, a wild bumblebee on my top set onion. Um, here are some good websites. Um, and as you can see, these hostas, and I brought there, they're from my garden in Nova Scotia. Um, they're really beyond the eating stage. So you can see how quickly um, the eating, eating stage goes by with hostas. The David Suzuki Foundation is wonderful. Anything from the spruce.com will give you good information. The other one that's very good um, that I don't think I've listed here is Permies, P-E-R-M-I-E-S dot com. That's the Permaculture Association. Uh, they have some very good how to um, videos. Um, the Eco Home Guides, again, um, edible perennials, they have a section on that. Um, I researched um, uh, quite a few sites on companies for growing seeds and plants. Um, even our West Coast seed uh, catalog is very good. It's just that they don't specialize in perennials. So you look at a lot of catalogs, but these, the restoration seeds um, uh, specializes in perennial edibles. Um, this um, particular site, the Etsy market site, um, it has a lot of different international sources. You can usually ship seeds internationally. Um, if it's um, um, bulbs and stuff like that, many of them you can't. For instance, you can't get onion sets from the state of Washington. Now, if you're on Facebook, um, there's a Vancouver Island company called Small Island Seed Co. And um, they don't have a website, they have a Facebook page. And so they're fun. So, um, that's about that. And let's, before we go, we'll um, take a look at some of um, the questions. What are we doing on time? We're past our time, um, April. Can we continue to go for a few minutes? Uh, yeah, I think I actually had it scheduled till 2.30, so. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, okay, handouts. Um, Deer resistant plants, okay. There's lots of deer resistant plants. The only, and this may seem a facetious answer and it's not, no one tells the deer. Deer will nibble different things at different times. Um, if something is succulent, the deer will eat it, sometimes so will the rabbits. I remember one year, all my hyacinths had crew cuts because uh, as they came out of the ground, the tops were nibbled off. Um, then the deer and the rabbit moved on, the rest of the plant grew. So if you're really concerned, you'll do what we all do, keep the deer away. Uh, and fencing is the best way to do that. I um, used to um, put um, bird netting over a lot of my plants because they, it would disappear and I never really tied it to the ground. Um, I think in five years, I caught one bird accidentally, managed to, to get him um, loose and let him go. Um, the most deer resistant plants that I came across were my big giants, my uh, cardoons and my artichokes. And uh, partly because um, they were big and spiky, partly because um, they were tubers. Um, the uh, daylily um, might get munched um, right at the very beginning of the year, but they didn't dig the tubers. I never did have a raccoon dig up any tuber. Um, how do you use nettles for nettle pesto? Um, that's a culinary question. Um, if I had more time, I'd, I'd talk to you about it. It's the same way you'll use the basil. Uh, and um, you can read it on site. I think the, uh, sorry, they were asking, do you use raw nettles for your nettle oh, pesto? Um, um, uh, you use wilted nettles. Um, so you, you, can, you can use them raw. Um, you can um, use them, um, you pour hot water over them. 
um, and wilt them very, very slightly and then um, use them. But if you go to a site that talks about make, how do I make pesto with nettles, they will explain everything. Uh, the name and spelling of perennial kale, daubenton, uh, D-A-U-B-E-N-T-O-N is your daub, or dauberton, E-R-T-O-N. Um, is your perennial kale. There are also a couple of new varieties. The one that you saw in the picture is a lovely rainbow colored one. Um, deer resistant um, downloads, well, that's good. Um, MGABC.org um, and uh, locally produced. Okay, good, thank you. Um, the seed co-op, uh, just like the West Coast seeds, uh, not all of them perennial, but anything local is always better. Um, yes, deer will avoid poisonous plants, and um, uh, but sometimes they'll taste them. We all know that daffodils are poisonous to deer. I watched a little uh, doe come out. I finally chased her away because she reached down and she bit the head off um, one of my prized narcissus and went, oh, patooey, spit it out, goes to the next one, bit it, spit it out. I could almost hear her saying, my God, there's got to be something tasty here. I finally chased her off. Yes, they were edible, but she tasted them first. So you know, there you go. And yes, they don't like strong uh, uh, scented plants. So I never had any of my herbs bothered by, um, by the deer. Um, I never had my burnet, which was tasty, bothered by deer. Um, so there you go. Um, another local uh, perennial seed uh, company on Salt Spring. Thank you. What about Good King Henry? That is a plant you see mentioned an awful, an awful lot. Um, it is a plant from a more Southern clime. I must say I never grew it and I really don't know much about it. But if you look in the books, they will tell you about Good King Henry. I do know that in certain climates, it can be um, rather rampant. I can't say invasive, but it can be uh, rampant. Um, there we go, the uh, uh, leaf eating insects starting to eat kale, um, chard and choy. I would have to know what type of insect it is. Um, usually the um, uh, leaf eating um, insect is the larvae. So you have the cabbage fly, but it's the caterpillar that eats it. And in our mild climate, you'll sometimes get more than one um, um, group. So you'll, you'll have the, the caterpillar eat in spring, and then we'll get a mild fall and those eggs will rehatch and they'll eat in the fall. Um, but that's about, that's about it. What else have we got here? Uh, I had hopes of eating chard all winter. Where was that? Um, companion planting within a perennial vegetable garden. Um, companion planting uh, often has a bad name because there was a whole group of people that magically the plant knows how to do this and that. No, they're simply not competing for resources. When I mentioned planting carrots and lettuce together, um, the carrot uses the ground quite deep the lettuce only uses the, the top. And so they make good companion planting. And yes, within a perennial vegetable garden, um, of course, you're going to be looking at that. And um, your permaculture people talk about that. And um, you've experienced the same thing in your non-edible um, ornamental garden. Um, the things that don't compete with each other that look good together. 
Um, I had little hoppers eating the chard in fall. That could be any number of plants, my or any number of uh, little critters. I'm sorry, without looking at it, it would be hard to tell you. My main problem with the chard were the leaf miners, um, uh, the spinach leaf miner. And so I would uh, very carefully um, uh, pick, the, pick the leaves off, squish the little guys, and I would keep them netted. Um, uh, the other thing that I did when I was growing them as annuals is that I wouldn't plant them until midsummer, and I would use them as a fall crop because they they are past the time in which that little guy um, is um, at the stage where it eats the leaves. Uh, any more questions? Um, our good King Henry has survived multiple moves and severe frost, so it seems hardy here. There we go. Thank you very much for that information. Never saw insects on the plants. Um, well, yeah, until you can find the insect, you can't um, uh, get the, uh, um, the, the proper way to deal with it. Um, and um, you don't necessarily have to spray it. Um, there are lots of non-toxic um, or exclusion methods for integrated pest management. Uh, any other questions um, before we go? Are we done? It looks, that looks like we're, we're done. Um, I do apologize that I, I went over um, a little bit. 